Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to talk about fine art printing. So if you've ever done any printing at home, you know that it can be a little bit challenging to figure out all of the things you need to do, find all the right settings, figure out which paper to use, which printer should I even buy. It can be a little bit overwhelming. I've been doing a lot of printing lately and I've learned a lot and really dialed in my process. So I wanted to make a video talking about the setup that I have, the gear that I use, and my entire process of going from digital image all the way to fine art print right here in my home studio. So like I said, I've been doing a lot of printing lately. I've started selling prints at a little boutique gallery in in Seattle called Venue. If you're in the Seattle area, it's, uh, it's over in Ballard. You can go check it out if you wanna see them in person. If you're not in the Seattle area, you can go to brianwlackey.com slash prints and see the prints that I have for sale there. If you happen to want to buy a print, then I really appreciate you. If you don't want to buy a print, I still appreciate you. Either way, choose your own adventure. Yeah, I've uh, had to do a lot of printing to, in order to build up the inventory to start selling prints there. So I wanted to have 30 prints available for sale in the gallery in a few different sizes. So did a lot of printing, went through a lot of paper and ink, learned a lot along the way. So that's what this video is about. We're gonna start with a couple caveats. So getting started printing at home is expensive. There's a lot of setup cost. The printer is expensive, the paper is expensive, the ink's expensive. Doing a bunch of crappy prints to start with when you're figuring it out wastes a lot of ink and paper. It's all expensive. If you only are gonna be making a few prints per year, it almost certainly doesn't make sense on paper to buy a printer and do this whole thing. So. Buying a printer and doing all of this makes sense if you're gonna sell a lot of prints, or if you just wanna have full control over the process, play around with it, learn something new. Um, I was somewhere in between, I sell some prints. It would probably still make sense financially to order them from a print lab, but it's nice to be able to just print really quickly and I, I enjoy the process. Uh, let's see, printing. You can go really deep down this rabbit hole. You can nerd out about printing. It, there's like, you can probably get a PhD in, in print technology. You don't have to. You can learn as much of this as you want, but the kind of stuff that I'm gonna talk about in this video will get you most of the way there and you're gonna get really good results. You're always going to struggle with having the image that you see printed on paper look exactly the same as an image backlit on a monitor. That's just the nature of having very different mediums here where we've got backlit, very luminous image and reflected light off of ink on paper. We can get really close, but this is gonna be something to be aware of. It's especially difficult when you've got really dark and or really saturated images. You're just pushing the, the technology a little bit, um, but we've got workarounds and we can get pretty close. The goal isn't to make an exact replica of what you see on a digital screen. You wanna get really close, but the goal is to have a print that looks really good. Um, I think that's all the caveats out of the way. I guess one more. There's lots of ways to do this. This is what works for me. So if you want, you can go watch a hundred different videos and see what other photographers recommend. Um, they're gonna find different papers that they like. This is what works for me. Let's get into it. So the first step, is to have a properly calibrated monitor. If you ever opened up your image on like your crappy work computer or on a phone instead of the computer that you're editing with and it looks different, every monitor, unless it's calibrated, looks different. It might be darker, brighter, more saturated. The color might be shifted one way or another. The printer doesn't know that. And so we wanna have, we wanna give ourselves uh, a standardized monitor output so that what we're seeing coming out of the monitor is what the printer thinks that we're seeing. And so the best way to do that is to use a dedicated piece of hardware that is a monitor calibrator. And um, you basically just put it right on top of the screen and it runs through some software. It outputs light from the monitor. The hardware reads what's coming out of the monitor and then it basically talks to the monitor and says, okay, in order to have a standardized output, this is the settings that you should have. 
uh, I already did that and I don't have my <laughs> the calibrator easily accessible here, but also it's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. I'm not gonna tell you how to calibrate your monitor. There are lots of videos out there that do a good job at that. It was very easy for me to figure out how to do it with um, all the information that's already out there on YouTube. So calibrate your monitor will give you the best chance of matching what you're seeing on your screen to what's coming out of your printer. That said, you're probably, you can probably get away without doing it just fine if you have a good monitor to start with. So these MacBook Pro monitors, the newer ones, they're really good out of the box, especially if you turn down the brightness to like halfway or something, otherwise it's way too bright. Um, it's gonna give you a pretty good starting point. And then maybe you do a test print, you've gotta make a couple different tweaks. It's a little bit too saturated or too bright or whatever. Um, so you can get away without calibrating your monitor. I went years without calibrating it with a different printer, a cheaper printer, and I got pretty good results. But if you wanna give yourself the best chance right out of the gate by a monitor calibrator, I will we'll list uh, what I use down in the description below. So once you've done that, you're setting yourself up for success. Then you want to open up your edited image in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you use. I do most of my editing in Lightroom. And uh, like I said, I'm just gonna be talking through my process. So that's what we're doing, Lightroom. So this is an image that I took in the San Juan Islands in Washington uh, two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, from the ferry looking back at a snow-covered Mount Baker, um, which is a volcano, one of our five volcanoes here in Washington. And this image recently sold at the gallery the other day in the 13 by 19 inch print. And so I need to do another print of this so that I can have it for sale again in that size at the gallery. So we're gonna print this one today. So because I've already gone through this process in the past, um, I've already prepared this file for print. I've sharpened it and resized it and adjusted the shadows a little bit. I have that file saved as a TIFF file. So really, if I weren't making this video, I would just open up that file, basically just press print, put in the paper, and we'd be good to go. But I'm gonna re-go through the process again just to show you what I did the first time. But just know that once you've prepared a file for print in that specific size, you can make as many prints of that size as you want without having to go through this process again. So. You have the file edited how you like it. Um, editing images is gonna be way beyond the scope of this video, but you can kind of see what I did there. It's pretty simple editing. Really, I just warmed it up a little bit and straightened it out. That's the, the raw file. That's what it looks like. So just mostly just warmed it up. Gave it the nice morning glow that uh, how I remembered it. So now we're going to edit in Photoshop. And this is where we're going to prepare the image for printing. So what I do is in Lightroom, I edit it how I would for uh, social media or my website or anything digital. Um, and then that's kind of my starting point. And now I'm going to do the final adjustments for print in Photoshop. You can do all of, the, all of this in Lightroom as well, but this is how I learned. So this is our starting point. We're going to have to do three things. We're going to resize and crop if needed to the size that we're going to print. We're going to want to sharpen it for print and then we're gonna adjust the shadows a little bit. I'll explain why we have to do that when I get to that step. So the first step is to resize. So you just go to image, image size. You want the resolution, at least on a Canon printer, to be 300 pixels per inch. Epson's might be different. So if you have an Epson printer, um, I should say, I'm using the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000 printer. Um, this Most of this is gonna be fairly consistent from printer to printer, but I know that for Canon printers, you generally wanna print at 300 pixels per inch. There's probably exceptions to that, but that's gonna serve you well. And so now I set this to, I want it to be 13 by 19. 13 by 19 is a little bit different aspect ratio from the rest of the print sizes that I offer. It's just slightly different. And so I'm gonna make it as close to 13 by 19 as I can here um, to where I just need to crop a little bit off the sides. So 13 by 19 and a half. And then I'm going to crop it with a 13 by 19 aspect ratio. I've got that up here 
I already typed it in from earlier, 13 by 19. And then let's see. And then I can adjust it if I want it to be slightly off center. That looks pretty good to me. And then oh, there we go. So now we have just to double check an image, image size, 19 inches wide, 13 inches high, 300 pixels per inch. If you're not doing any printing, the pixels per inch doesn't matter. So that's a, a little bit of a common misconception, but uh, yeah, generally not something you have to worry about unless you're printing. So this is our starting point. So it's a big file. We've got lots of detail in here. Um, the next step generally is sharpening. I'm not too worried in this case about sharpening because when I look, zoomed in at 100%, this is the size that it's going to be printed at. It looks really sharp on the, the parts of the image that should be sharp. And I, I clearly focused at infinity here, focused on the volcano. You can see like the, the fairy isn't 100% sharp, but that's fine, I didn't want it to be. Um, and uh, yeah, so the part of the image that should be sharp is, and I don't think it needs any additional sharpening. sharpening. However, if I wanted to, um, I would, go in there are lots of ways to sharpen an image and uh, every photographer has a different opinion on this one thing that's worked well for me is just doing the smart sharpen filter so you go to the filter smart sharpen and then i kind of just play around with these three here zoom this around until i get to a part that i want to look at and then i keep it pretty pretty minor i don't want my images to look super crunchy and sharp i'm not that's not the style that i'm going for um, and you can see what it looks like before and after. In this case, not much of a difference. So you could hit okay. I'm just gonna hit cancel because in this case, I don't think that the image needs any sharpening for print. And then hit it back to fit screen so we can see the whole image there. Now we've got one more step before taking it into the print software. If we open up a levels layer here, this histogram here shows us what percentage of the image is uh, at each of these, at the tones, from complete black on the left to complete white on the right. And the nature of printing on paper, this is different for every paper, but generally the darkest of the shadows don't really print very well on paper. This is especially true with matte papers. So my favorite paper, and I'll talk about this when we get to the actual printing stage. My favorite paper is the Canson Infinity Rag Photographique, which is a, a really nice matte paper. It doesn't really print any detail in kind of this bottom, uh, about the, the bottom 20 points. So. 20 out of 256 here. So what that means is that if I press the option key and then drag this over to about 20, anything that's showing up there is going to be basically just completely black in the image and you're not gonna see the details. So most of the detail that we're subtly seeing here in the shadows here would just look like a, a kind of muddy silhouette. So there's a couple ways to deal with that. One you can do directly in the print software and it basically just brightens the whole image to where it sets the blackest point at the blackest point that can print on the paper. That can work. But what it ends up doing a lot of times is just essentially this, where it would just brighten the whole image a little bit and it looks kind of washed out. I can work on some, some images, but I generally prefer to do a slightly more manual approach. So what I do is apply a curves layer here and I put it underneath the levels layer. The levels layer we're just using to test all of this. The curves layer is where we're actually doing some adjustments. And then what we essentially want to do is raise the black point up a little bit. And we'll go back and forth and tweak this until it looks right. But if we just raise the black point up, then it's doing the exact same thing that I just showed where it brightens the whole image essentially and looks a little bit washed out. So what we want to do is create a curve here where 
for most of the image from the brightest all the way down to the, the medium dark shadows, if you will, the curve is just a straight diagonal line. So if we want to make sure that that's um, as unchanged as possible, we make we click on each of these points and make sure that the input and the output values are the exact same. So 112, 112, click 196, make that 196. And then you can add a few more if you need to, but that's generally gonna look good. And now when we raise this point here, it's going to affect the darkest shadows without brightening the midtones and the highlights of the image. So we're gonna raise that, oh, maybe 10 or 12, and then go back to the levels here. And we can see that the whole histogram shifted a little bit to the right. When we turn off the curves layer, this is what it originally looked like. And then when we turn it off, turn back on the curves adjustment, it looks like this. So we brightened the shadows just a little bit without brightening the whole image. And now if I press the option key and click and drag over here, we can see that the shadows aren't really getting washed out until about 15 or 17. So I know based on some testing with this paper that things start to get washed out a little before then. So I'm going to raise this a little higher and then go back and test this out. Now it looks like we're seeing the shadows start to wash out about 20, which is pretty good to me. So you can see it makes a subtle difference, but enough to where we're going to get a little more shadow detail on the paper than we would otherwise. I'm OK if it washes out a little bit. Um, because it's a shadow, it's okay if it's dark, but I don't want it to be completely um, just muddy silhouette there. So that's the most complicated part of this whole thing. So feel free to go back and watch that again if you need. Generally, we're using this curves adjustment layer to make a, a straight line here with some points that hold it in place, and then we're lifting just the shadows. There are some other ways to do that if you already know how to use luminosity masks, you can do that. That's not something that I use. So this works for me. And now the levels, we didn't do anything with this. This was just so that we could see what the histogram looked like and see where the black point was falling. So you can delete the levels curve if you want. Doesn't make a difference or it doesn't make a difference. It's not doing anything. So the next step is just to flatten the image or merge visible. In this case, it does the same thing. So now we have an image that's ready for print. So what I do is I go file, save as, and then I save it as a TIFF on my desktop. Or if it's one that you know you're gonna be printing time and time again, like in this case, I would save it to my print files folder and it's called the, the fairy. 13 by 19 TIFF, and so that I know that next time I want to print this same image again in this size, I already have that file printed. So because I've already done that in the past, I'm just going to hit cancel and not save this because I don't want to overwrite the previous work that I've done. I want to make sure that the second print that I make is exactly the same as the first print that I made with the same settings. So that's all I have to do to prepare the file for print. The next step is opening the file in Canon's printer software. You can print directly from Photoshop. You can print directly from Lightroom. I like to print in Canon's, uh, I think it's called Professional Print Studio software. So now we open up Professional Print and Layout by Canon. Um, I'm sure Epson has their own software. Again, I'm, I'm only sharing what I know in my process. So for Canon printers, this is what I use. Um, I think the software comes with the Canon Pro 300. 1000 and any of the really big ones. I don't know that it comes with the older Canon 100 and 200, so you'd have to print from Photoshop um, and uh, lots of resources on figuring out how to do that. But everything up until this point would be the exact same. So now I open up the file in Professional Print and Layout. I do File Open. I find where I've saved that file. So in this case, it is the fairy 13 by 19tiff And I open that up. And now we go over here. So I have all of these settings stored as a custom setting. So I go to Canson Infinity Rag 13 by 19. 
you won't have that because you haven't saved these settings before. But once you get all of the settings, if it's a, a layout, like a paper and an image size that you're going to be using a lot, you can go to stored settings, uh, save current settings, and then basically just make a shortcut here. So this is what I do, but I'll walk you through all of the different media types, um, all the different settings, everything that I use to make sure that the software is telling the printer exactly what to do so that we get the right output from the printer. So starting from the top, working down, um, you got to select your printer. Hopefully you're able to figure out how to install your printer and get everything set up on your own. Um, I'm available for IT consulting. I'm, I'm not, I'm not available for IT consulting, um, but hopefully you can figure that out. Um, you can do a single image mode or you can print it to where you've got multiple images on a page. In this case, we're doing a single image on Canson Infinity Rag. So this media type here would not show up without me doing something first. So we go to Canson's, not to be confused with Canon, Canson's website. So I just searched Canson Infinity Rag Photographic on Canon Pro 1000. And with the mag magic of Google, it takes me right to their ICC profiles page, which I won't even pretend to understand that I know what that actually is. Um, but it's basically a set of instructions that tells your printer what the paper, how the paper works, how much ink to print, where, I don't know, you pick this setting and then it works with the printer and the paper. So it's going to be different from different paper brands. I like Canson Infinity Rag Photographic a lot. I like matte papers. Um, this is my go-to paper. I use it for all of my prints. Some people like having a couple different papers that they use. Maybe their black and white images go on um, a glossier paper and their really dark images go on a variety of paper. And maybe they like a matte paper for more of a, a high key airy looking image. I made the decision to just test out, a, <laughs> test out a bunch of different papers and pick one that I really liked and get to know that paper really well. So whether you pick one paper or two papers or maybe three papers, I would do some testing and then find the ones that you like and then stick with those because it makes a lot, you're gonna get better results and waste a lot less paper and have more consistent results if you really get to know one or two papers than if you're constantly playing around with new ones. Feel free, but that's what I would recommend. Um, so when I went through this process, I tried a, a few papers from Canson, a few papers from Hanamule or Hanamule. It's German, I don't know how to pronounce it. And I've used papers in the past from a brand called Red River, which if you're in the US is a good option. It's a, quite a bit cheaper and mostly as good as a lot of these. I know some photographers who really swear by Red River, but I tried a few of them and I really liked the matte paper from Canson. Um, and it's, uh, it's my favorite. So I use Canson Infinity Rag Photographic, quite the name. So then I go to Canson's website. If you are using a Hanamule paper, you'll go to Hanamule's website. If you're in the UK and you're using a photo speed paper, you'll go to the photo speed website and they will have an ICC profile. Just Google it. And it's unique to your printer and the paper itself. So I go to Canon. It's very confusing that we have Canon and Canson. I don't know what the history is there, probably just a coincidence, but I have a Canon printer and then I go down and I find the Pro 1000, the Image ProGraph Pro 1000 printer, which is what I have. And then you find the Hanamule, or the, sorry, the Canson paper. And I would scroll down and find the Rag Photographic 310 grams per square meter. Click on that, download it. And then there's some instructions here on how to install those printer profiles. In this case, um, they also included an AM1X file, which I hadn't seen before. But that, that um, comes into play later on. So you can install both of those. So now once we've installed that, maybe you have to 
do that and then restart the software. I'm not sure, but it, it should show up in the custom. You can name it. So now after all of that, I'm gonna do that one time per paper. I can click cancel infinity rag and the media type. And now the printer knows, okay, I'm printing on this specific paper. I need to print in this specific way for it to look right. Um, next step, pick the paper size. In this case, I'm printing 13 by 19, but I like to have a little bit of a white border around. So I print on 17 by 22 inch paper, which I believe in the rest of the world is A2 or close to it. And um, yeah, that's as big as this printer goes. If you wanna print bigger than 17 inches wide, you gotta get a bigger printer. And then that's even more expensive. If you wanna never print that big, then the Canon Pro 300 is a pretty good option as well. Um, in this case, the manual feed tray, which is the one in the very back, that is the only option that's giving me. And that's based on just the fact that this is a really thick paper. So I have to feed each, if I'm doing a bunch of prints, I have to feed a new sheet of paper in manually each time. And it is a little bit annoying. Um, I generally just go with the high print quality here. I, from what I understand, that's fine. And the highest isn't going to make much of a difference and just use more ink. I'm not positive on that, but it seems to get me good results. And then I center the image. And then from that point, I go over here to this image that I've opened. Um, and I click the little plus sign and it moves it to the middle. Now this is already the correct size because this is a um, stored custom setting. But if it wasn't, if I hadn't done this for the first time, I would just click on the image go down to the size here and click image size. And now it's gonna make the image the correct size. So I have that centered on the alignment on the layout here. And then if you wanted it to not be centered, you could move it left or right with these sliders. Um, so everything else should be fairly self-explanatory. And then color mode, make sure that you select use ICC profile so that it knows to use the ICC profile um, and then the printer profile, uh, that's the ICC profile down there. The media type, this might be where um, the A1, I'm a little out of my element here, but I think this is what the AM1X file is. That's, that's where the, the media type comes in. So if it doesn't have that, a lot of times the information paper on the information sheet, so like when you get new paper it comes with information sheet here um it'll tell you oh this is a map paper just select uh like photo paper like map photo paper or something um but in this case canson provided a custom um custom setting custom file for that just to make sure i did everything right there okay and now Printer profile, this is where you click the printer profile. Um, so I think I was wrong earlier. I think the media type is not with the, it's not the same thing as ICC profile, but it's it's related. The printer profile, the ICC profile is loaded down here. That's what I installed from that website. And um, click on this one. So it looks like gibberish, but it's Canson Infinity for this printer rag photo 310. That's That's the one that we downloaded. Rendering intent. I remember when I was first starting printing, seeing that and being like, I have no idea what that is. I hope that that does not matter. After a lot of digging, I've learned that 99.9% .9 of the time for us who are doing this kind of photography, perceptual is the right answer. You don't need to know any more than that. Relative colorimetric is it's a very specialist thing. So if you're doing like catalog work or something and you need the red dress that you're photographing to be exactly that color red, no matter what, then it will force that and then let the thing, the, the colors and the tones that are outside of the gamut do whatever they need to do to make sure that that color red is exactly the same. Like I said, it doesn't matter. I don't fully understand what relative color, colorimetric does. Just know that you pick perceptual. And that's good enough. Black point compensation is a sort of automatic way of doing what we did with the curves layer. So instead of 
clicking those dots on the curves layer and then raising the shadows a little bit, you can just click the black point compensation button and it tries to do that for you. And on some images, it'll look fine. On some images, it will wash it out a little bit, but I like to do it manually, so I do not click that. So you don't wanna go through the manual process of doing the shadow adjustments in a curves layer. Feel free to experiment with just clicking use black point compensation there. I will also say that on glossier papers or like a Barita paper, they can print more of the shadows. So if you're printing a lot of darker images, then maybe a matte paper isn't going to be the right answer for you. I like what matte papers look like, so I'm happy to make that trade off. And then that's it. This button down here, soft proofing, shows the, the print software's estimate of what the printed image is going to look like. So when I uncheck that, this is what the image file looks like on the computer. And then when you check the soft proofing box, which has been checked this whole time, this is what the image, the software says, okay, this is what it's going to look like. So it thinks that some of these shadow details are going to be lost a little bit that I didn't adjust the shadows quite enough to not lose any detail. And that's probably true. I'm okay with that though. And um, it's, it's still pretty close. You can see the colors shift very slightly and um, that's not a very big deal to me. I don't need it to match exactly to what I'm seeing on the screen, but if you wanted to adjust that, you could um, do some adjustments in the color settings directly here, which I've never played with, or you could go back into Photoshop or Lightroom and adjust the hue or saturation or whatever other settings to try and make it match exactly. But you can see these are pretty damn close and I'm not trying to get it 100% accurate, I'm not making a scientific reproduction of what this looked like. I just want it to look really good on paper and it's really close to begin with. So now, I click print. Again, I'm assuming that you know how to set up the printer and connect it to your computer. This is way out of the scope of this video. We're going in depth enough anyway. So now we press print and then put it in a piece of paper and press okay on the printer when it says, are you ready to print? And then we get a printer, we get a print coming right out of the printer and hopefully it looks good. We have ourselves a fresh new print made entirely in my home office. And it looks damn good, in my opinion. I'm checking for blemishes, making sure nothing weird happened. You're not getting 100% of the shadow detail down here, but you're getting a, a lot more than you would have if we didn't do any adjustments. And uh, to my eye, it looks pretty damn good. I am happy with that. So now we just have to let it dry for at least a few hours. I usually just have it dry overnight and then frame it or package it for shipping or whatever you're gonna do with it next. But before you put it behind glass or anything, let the ink dry for at least a few hours. Um, so yeah, now I'm gonna mat this and prepare it for delivering to the gallery. All of that will be maybe in another video if there's any interest in how to matte prints or how to frame prints or anything like that. But from here, you can do lots of things with the print. You can frame it yourself. You can package it to ship to clients. You can send it to a gallery. You can burn it if you don't like it. You can do whatever you want with it. So this is where I will end this video. We went from a digital file to a nice fine art print. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, let me know down in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you are interested in a print, you can go to brianwlackey.com slash prints to check out the different options there. Um, prints ship free anywhere in the US and if you're somewhere else, shoot me an email so we can see how much shipping would cost before we commit to that because I don't wanna ship you a print if it's gonna cost you $1,000 for shipping or something ridiculous. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Let me know if you have any questions and I will see you in the next video. Bye.